Sometimes these videos lead me down some very strange rabbit holes. This week's video has led me down a rabbit hole that involved the Feast of Chestnuts. And I will get to explaining what the Feast of Chestnut was and how it is relevant to art, patronage and politics. Hello and welcome to another episode of Just in Time Worlds. My name is Marie Mullaney. Today I'm going to discuss art and the patronage of artists and how that is relevant to politics in a fantasy world. First, if you like this kind of world building content, please do hit the subscribe button. Before we get into patronage and politics, first I just want to define what I'm talking about when I say art in this case. I'm specifically talking about visual art, tapestries, plates, paintings, that kind of art. If you're looking for performing arts, I did do a video on that, which you can check out over there on how to use performing arts in fantasy worlds. If you would like to connect with me around world building, I do have a Discord server. Link in the comments down below where you can request additional videos or discuss these videos more with other world builders, as well as find out news about my books and my epic series, The Sangwheel Chronicles. Okay, let's get cracking. The word patronage comes to us from Rome, where it defined a political favor system where you had patrons and patrons had clients. Patrons supported the clients monetarily. Clients supported the patrons through voting and all kinds of other favors. In the Middle Ages, art was pretty much a commission-based activity. So I would commission the artist. They would make the art that I am commissioning them to make. They were more like craftsmen than like artists as we understood them now. That started changing during the Renaissance period, first when patronage became more common. Patronage in this sense was initiated or formalized at least by the Medici family of Florence. Lorenzo Medici famously founded an art academy and he's actually the guy who discovered Leonardo da Vinci. What the patronage system brought in was that while artists still had to produce art that flattered their patrons because otherwise their patrons would stop supporting them and they'd end up starving in the gutter, they did have slightly more freedom to create art and art started to be judged on its artistic merits rather than its craftsman merits. And then eventually someone had the first art auction and art started to be sold as art pieces individually based on how attractive people found it. And that resulted in art that we have today. To really understand the effect that commissions and patronage had on politics, we need to go back to the Middle Ages and understand what we're looking at when we see the art created at this time. The art produced in the Middle Ages was not there to be decorative. It was there to provide information and sometimes misinformation. That's why the coats of arms feature so heavily in everything from paintings to tapestries to plates to stained glass windows. Those coats of arms were proclaiming allegiance, ownership and fealty. And you can see it in some of the sample illustrations on the whiteboard. As the artist, you had very little control over these coats of arms. They were controlled by the heralds, and it was serious business to falsify your heraldic symbols. If you want to know more about heraldry, you can check out my interview with Carl from Draw Shield in the video card now. In my world, I treat heraldry in much the same way except I have it displayed on the Noble Sash, which I made a one-minute video about linked in the information cards. In the Empire of Lumiaron, a man will get 20 lashes in the town square for faking a sash. If he fakes a ducal sash, a purpure sash, that's a death sentence. If you think my world sounds interesting, the first book of Sangwheel Chronicles, The Hidden Blade by Marie M. Mullaney, is on pre-sale now, and will be available on 10 September 2021. Right, enough plugging, let's get back to the art. Remember, art is information. 
Thomas of Howard, the third Duke of Norfolk, found out the hard way that information can get you killed. He had an artist quarter his coat of arms with a royal coat of arms, and you can see how he did that on the whiteboard now. He had the right to do this because he had a royal ancestor in the shape of Edward the Confessor. But while he might have had the legitimate right to do so, it certainly wasn't politic to do so. And Henry VIII had the Duke tossed into the tower and he was only saved from execution by the fact that the king died the day before Thomas's execution was supposed to take place. So if you're setting your world in a semi-medieval setting where art is primarily about allegiances and the display of loyalty, remember that it's got a very direct influence on politics. In our current day and age, it's a common expression to say the optics don't look good. Well, in the medieval world, art was the optics, and if you got them wrong, you could lose your head. Okay, so now we've got a fairly clear idea of medieval art, but what about the Renaissance and the patronage system? And what about that elusive feast of chestnuts? It is finally time to talk about Pope Alexander. This is his portrait that was painted for him. See how serious he looks, how morally upright the father of his children, the Catholics. Okay, that same dude had what is now called the Feast of Chestnuts. They would gather, him and his cardinals, and they would have 50 or so prostitutes, naked prostitutes. And then they would roast chestnuts on like an open fire. And then the girls would go amongst these fires and go and gather up the chestnuts. And after the Feast of chestnuts, they then engaged in a orgy, and a literal orgy, where they kept track of things like who came the most times and other really gruesome details that nobody needed to know about. And yet this was his artist's rendition. And you have to really know where to dig to find out about the Feast of Chestnuts. I should add that there is some dispute about if the Feast of Chestnuts actually took place. There is only one contemporary source, Bouchard. The source is his private journal, so it does have some credence, but it is not an indisputable fact. Or another great example of the effect that patronage had on artists is Pope Leo of the Medici family. Remember the Medici family, the guys who brought in the whole patronage? He achieved the papacy and went to town partying to the extent that he almost bankrupted the Vatican. And yet this is his official portrait as painted by his bought and paid for artist. And then, of course, there is the fairly famous iconography of Queen Elizabeth I. This is the style of painting that we have of her on the whiteboard now. And you can see that this is a very kind of formalized style where she is replacing some of the iconography of the Virgin Mary. In the movie Elizabeth, which is a terribly historically inaccurate movie, do not take that as an actual historical commentary on the life of Elizabeth I. You will be sadly mistaken in your judgment of facts. But they did make a big deal of her being painted like this because what she was trying to do was combat a lot of misinformation that had been distributed about what she looked like. And after the excommunication by the Pope, she wanted to communicate that she was still England's queen. Because, again, art wasn't just art. Art was information. In a pre-literate world, Pictures were the way that people remembered. Murals, tapestries, plates, paintings, lockets, all of these things were very, very key to the information that was being spread about the rich and the powerful, who also patronized the artists and therefore controlled the narrative through art. So we've got a very clear historical context of 
patronage and art and how it was used in our history to control the narrative by the rich and powerful. But how do you use that in a fantasy setting? What you have to bear in mind is that what is displayed about the person and what the person is, is only related by implication. When you're doing things like placing decorations within a building, like portraits and the like, even if it's depicting a scoundrel, if that scoundrel is the patron of the artist who painted it, it is likely to be a flattering portrait. And the information provided by that portrait to those who view it is that this is a good and righteous person, even if he's having feasts of chestnuts all over the place. The second important thing to remember is Heraldry is a very important piece of art that is likely to be displayed in tapestries, in plates, in murals, everywhere, because it shows the loyalty of the person whose heraldic device is on display and where their honor lies. And don't forget that lying by using heraldry incorrectly or implying things with heraldry could very well create an enormous amount of tension. And people can lose their heads over this. It can be a treasonable offense, as we saw in our own history not that long ago. Lastly, remember that essentially in a world where literacy is less common and where pictures are how information spreads, patronage is control of the narrative. Patronage is how misinformation is created. So if you need to spread information through this pre-literate world, you would do well to commission a few artists to make a few tapestries and a few paintings that can be used to support that narrative going forward. I hope that you have enjoyed this episode of Just In Time Worlds. My name is Marie Mullaney. If you would like to support me in making more of these videos, I do have an, a page over at Ko-fi where you can buy me a cup of coffee for one euro. And also my book, The Hidden Blade, is available to pre-order. I hope that you enjoy it if you do buy it. And I will see you soon for another episode.